question about... Yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much, and we are looking forward to hearing your, your presentation. Thank you, Floor. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, conference and the opportunity to share some of the insights with you. As uh, the Rector has said, climate change is here. It will affect people's lives. Not only will climate change affect our lives, but our society's efforts to address climate change and to mitigate climate change will also affect our lives in many ways. What I want to do today is speak about the role of forests in the global carbon cycle, speak about the impacts of climate change and some of the mitigation options that are available to us. I will follow this outline for my presentation speak about the role of forests in the carbon cycle, the impacts of climate change, the forest sector-based mitigation options, and also the role of bioenergy from forests as a means to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, and then I'll have a short slide of conclusions. In the beginning of October, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released the first report of the sixth assessment cycle about the efforts required by society to save the low at global average temperature increase of 1.5 degrees centigrade. The IPCC concluded in its summary to policymakers that an increase of global average temperatures by 1.5 degrees centigrade could be reached as early as 2030, in other words, 12 years from now. The IPCC also identified to limit warming to just 1.5 degrees will require rapid and far-reaching transformations in energy systems, land, industry, buildings, transport, and cities. In other words, all aspects of society would have to undergo dramatic changes because to limit warming to 1.5 degrees would require that global emissions be decreased by approximately 45% from 2010 levels by 2030 in 12 years and reach net zero by approximately 2050. If we want to have a 66% probability to keep warming to just 1.5 degrees, we are not allowed to add more than about 420 billion tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Contrast that with current rates of emission, which are about 42 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year. In other words, within 10 years, we could have used up the permissible budget. And what comes in addition is that feedback to climate change, such as the permafrost thawing and the associated releases of methane, a very potent greenhouse gas, from wetlands and permafrost systems could add up to 100 billion tons of carbon dioxide over the course of this century and more thereafter. And in addition, there are other feedbacks which we will speak about that are not or only poorly represented in models. Driving all this is the concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Methane, and CO2, which I'm showing here, have been increasing, as have been other greenhouse gases. Charles Keeling started measuring the CO2 concentration in the Northern Hemisphere in 1958. And since then, emissions have increased from about 310 parts per million to over 400 parts per million, relative to the pre-industrial concentrations we have now reached a 46% increase and the rate of increase continues. Driven by the emissions and the incessant burning of fossil fuels, this is the graph. Just from 1990, the emissions of CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels have nearly doubled from about 22 to now about 37 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year. We have some good news, there won't be much today, but there is some good news, and that is that the rate of increase in the Earth's atmosphere 
is much more than you would expect from the emissions alone because about half of the carbon dioxide that is emitted from fossil fuel burning and deforestation, the land use change from forest to non-forest land uses, is taken up by oceans and by forests. So that less than half remains in the atmosphere. In fact, 30% of the fossil fuel emissions are absorbed by forests. But the big question is whether this sink, the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, whether this sink can be sustained into the future or perhaps even enhanced. The understanding that forests play an important role in the global carbon cycle is also represented in the Paris Agreement that was signed in 2015 with the goal to limit temperature rises to well below 2 degrees centigrade. Countries from around the world have committed to undertake a number of activities to limit emissions by 2030 and further reduce emissions thereafter. Most of the countries have identified that forests will play an important role in their efforts to achieve re emissions reductions. What the Paris Agreement has also made clear for the first time is that in order to stay below 2 degrees, we have to achieve net zero global emissions in the second half of the century. In fact, we have to achieve net negative emissions. What I mean by that is that the consequences of human activities must remove more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than they're adding to it. On the left side of this graph, you see different pathways, possible pathways of the future. And only the lowest CO2 concentration pathway on this diagram is the one that would help us stay below 2 degrees centigrade. And if you look, what it means is that emissions, that CO2 concentrations peak around 2030, that emissions peak around 2020 and decline thereafter. But what is more important is that in the latter half of the century, we have to have net negative emissions. That means we need to remove more CO2 from the atmosphere than we're adding to it. So if you look at this diagram, what it shows is the historic emissions in the past, the pathway in the black line that we need to follow if we want to reach 2 degrees centigrade, having net negative emissions in the latter half of the century. But here you see how woefully inadequate the current emission reduction pledges of the world are. The intended nationally determined contributions of countries, their rate of greenhouse gas emission reduction, is not anywhere near sufficient to keep temperatures rising to just 2 degrees. The land sector will play a very big role in removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and there are a number of negative emission technologies that are being identified. These will affect the global forest sector. In order to achieve the large land-based carbon sinks that are required, the world must increase afforestation, reforestation, restoration of degraded lands, over several hundred million to two billion hectares of the world. Of course, these lands are currently competing with other land uses for food production uh, and many other uses. To put 2 billion hectares in perspective, the total forest area of the world right now is 4 billion hectares. So we need to increase the global forest area by perhaps as much as 50%. There are also means of intensifying forest management, increased conservation, and in particular the increased use of long-lived wood products, the increased use of bioenergy and biomass-based liquid transportation fuels, and the holy grail in this whole game, the idea that by having bioenergy combined with carbon capture and storage, we may be able to remove large quantities of CO2 from the atmosphere. <coughs> but let us not be fooled. At the moment, the operational capacity for BEX is approximately zero. There are a few experiments ongoing 
but nothing at the scale that will be required to remove 600 billion tons of CO2 from the Earth's atmosphere by the end of the century. The bioeconomy has many potential uses for woody biomass, but the future demand could far exceed the sustainable supply. So bioenergy with carbon capture and storage is indeed a promising idea, but we must be careful that the promise of unrealistically large future things derived from BEX and the land sector more generally must not become an excuse to maintain current fossil fuel emissions. People are reluctant to reduce fossil fuel emissions because they think that the land sector will help them solve the problem. But if the land sector fails to deliver these large sinks, then the temperature goals will be even less attainable. And it would require even greater mitigation efforts to then stay within 2 degrees. However, it is important for us to recognize that the land sector, and in particular forests, can contribute to climate change mitigation strategies, and we will be speaking about that more throughout the morning. The recognition that CO2 must be removed from the atmosphere was also, has also led to the issuing of the X Prize, a $20 million announcement for those who can develop new groundbreaking transformational approaches to convert CO2 emissions into valuable products. And for those of us who are foresters, we're thinking, well, wait, haven't we been doing this for a long time? Are we not removing CO2 from the atmosphere and turning it into valuable products by producing wood for buildings and other uses? In fact, we have been doing this for centuries, as this 344-year-old house in Switzerland shows. Because wood is 50% by weight made from carbon, and to produce one cubic meter of wood, that cube in the upper right-hand corner, or the wood in the telephone pole, we remove one ton of CO2 from the atmosphere. So there's a very close link between the production of wood and the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. Let me switch gears and speak for a few minutes to the impacts of climate change. First of all, it is important for us to understand that climate change impacts will be both positive and negative. They will affect growth rates, they will affect mortality rates of trees, and they will affect disturbances. Where temperatures are limiting, warmer temperatures and longer growing seasons may enhance tree growth, but they will also re result in greater drought, higher tree mortality, and more disturbances. So understanding where, when, and how impacts of climate change will occur is necessary for us to design mitigation and adaptation strategies for the forest sector. We must also understand that the temperature increases and the impacts of climate change are not uniformly distributed across the world. Swante Arrhenius, a Swedish scientist in 1896, wrote the first paper on the impacts of carbon dioxide in the air on the temperature on the ground. And he predicted in 1896 that the temperatures will be higher in northern regions and the temperature increases will be greater in the winter. <coughs> And in fact, this is what we see. This diagram shows the temperature increases uh, on land relative to the 1950s. And it shows that particularly the boreal regions and the temperate regions of Europe, North America, and Eurasia have shown above average temperature increases. In fact, here's a chart from Canada, and you can see that Winter temperatures in some regions of Canada have increased relative to about 1950 by 4 and 5 degrees centigrade already. 5 degrees centigrade when the global average temperature increase has only been 1 degree. So the regional amplification can be very large. And with just 1 degree of warming on global averages, we already see and feel the impacts of climate change around the world. I just remind you of the forest fires. In fact, as we speak, there are huge forest fires burning in California. 
having killed at least 50 people, 55 as of this morning, and still 150 missing. But we have seen forest fires in Sweden this summer. We have seen forest fires in Spain, in Greece, in Portugal, in Canada, in Russia, in Alaska. All over the world, we see big increases in forest fires. We see big increases in diseases and insects, as is shown in the upper left hand. In the left, on the middle, we see impacts of permafrost thawing. These are Genoma soils in Siberia, where 30 meter deep permafrost is thawing and melting as a consequence of climate warming. Here, a picture from the north of Canada, where huge areas of forests are dying. As the permafrost is thawing, the water table is rising, and the trees don't have oxygen access anymore. In addition to the impacts on forests, we see big storm events and we see loss of sea ice, which is perhaps the most serious of the impacts because when you replace a white surface of ice with open ocean, the absorption of temperature by the water increases dramatically and the energy balance is changed. Forests are both part of the problem and part of the solution in global climate change. The net greenhouse gas balance of forests is a small difference between two very large fluxes. The removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis and tree growth, and the release through the decomposition of organic matter and through fires. All major, all major processes that drive carbon fluxes in ecosystems are sensitive to environmental changes, whether that is tree growth, mortality, decomposition, disturbances, permafrost, or many others. This diagram just shows you an example of the carbon cycle of Canada's forests. And you see the very large influx of carbon into the forests associated with tree growth and net primary productivity, and the very large outflow due to heterotrophic respiration. Both of these fluxes are sensitive to climate change, and the balance between them determines whether these forests are net sinks or net sources in addition to the impacts of these businesses. It is still very challenging for scientists to predict what the net impacts of climate change on the greenhouse gas balance of forests will be. It will vary regionally and it will vary over time. But one thing is clear. There is what I have been calling for a long time an asymmetry of risk. Forests grow slowly. It takes decades and sometimes centuries to accumulate the carbon in a forest, but it can be released very quickly, for example, through forest fires. These long growth cycles to maturity can easily be interrupted by disturbance events or other extreme events like fire, insects, wind thrown, drought, or flood. And that contributes to this asymmetry of risk, and that is what makes it likely that the impacts of climate change on forests in general will be negative. Another reason that forests are so strongly affected by climate change is the increasing maladaptation of trees in a shifting climate. Trees are accustomed to the climate regime in which they have evolved over centuries. When the climate shifts northward or to higher elevations, it means that the species, particularly at the southern range of their climate, are increasingly maladapted and stressed. And this increased stress often results in reduced growth rates, increased mortality, and in particular, increased susceptibility to insects and diseases. And we see those impacts occurring around the world. I'll give you again some examples from my home province. On the left is a map of the distribution of climate zones today. And each of these climate zones has a particular vegetation type that is co common in, its, in the zone. On the right-hand side, you see the prediction of the distribution of climate zones by the end of the century. You notice how the zones are all shifting. And that means that the trees that are in the systems where they are today will not experience the same climate in the future decades. And that is resulting in stress, mortality, and vulnerability to insects. 
In British Columbia, in the 2000s, we experienced an outbreak of a native insect. This is not an introduced species. This is a native insect that was able to expand its range considerably as a result of warming and has killed and affected pine trees over an area of 18 million hectares in British Columbia. It's killed about 800 million cubic meters of wood and this wood, much of it, is now standing in the forest, drying, and is increasingly vulnerable to fires. In 2017, we had very large fires, 1.2 million hectares burned, and as you can see on this map here, the areas that were most strongly affected by the mountain pine needle are also the areas in which these forest fires occurred. The timeline of forest fires dating back all the way to 1920 shows that the area burned in 2017 was 50% more than the highest area ever recorded in 1958. And relative to the area burned in the last 20 years, the average annual area burned, 2017 was 15 times the area of the pellets in the first place. It's also important to understand that bioenergy is less energy intensive than fossil fuels. And therefore, to produce one unit of energy, we often cause emissions to the atmosphere from bioenergy use that are greater than those of fossil fuel use. It's only because the forests will regrow and remove the carbon from the atmosphere that over time this is beneficial to the atmosphere. And of course, agricultural biomass with an annual growth cycle is even more beneficial. I already spoke about the contribution of transportation fuels. The last point I want to make is that biomass is a limited resource. When I talk with my colleagues around the world, it is clear that there are many people who want to use wood, whether that's the architects and builders who want to build mass timber buildings, whether it's the bioenergy community, <coughs> biojet fuels, bioplastics, textiles made from wood, etc. Everybody is looking to wood and trees to solve their emissions problem. And as a consequence, the future demand for wood and biomass could far exceed the sustainable supply. So what we need to do as land managers is quantify the sustainable supply and prioritize how and where this wood is used. We can also improve the supply through better silvicultural and enhanced forest management, rehabilitation and restoration of degraded lands, fertilization, and in some cases, the production of energy plantations. We can better utilize the forest, leaving less material at harvest. We can reduce slash burning. We can salvage dead trees following mortality triggered by climate change. And, and this is an important aspect even here, is we can look at fuel management to reduce future fire risks and then use the biomass in a bioeconomy. There are management options like this picture here shows very clearly we know how to manage forests better so that they can grow faster. And as you can see here, you know, the carbon uptake rate, at least per tree, and in some cases per hectare, can be greatly increased through forest management. And people say this will cost money. And yes, it will cost money. Society will have to spend money to address global climate change. But failing to do so will also cost us a lot of money. In British Columbia, in the last four years alone, we spent $1.6 billion, billion dollars, on fire suppression efforts alone. And the alternatives to removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere are also very expensive. There are companies that are working on engineering systems. This is a company just north of Vancouver, climate engineering, uh, carbon engineering, that are uh, developing machines that are removed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And they can do that. They, they remove about one ton per day right now. But the costs, if these were scaled up to an operational scale, would be somewhere around $150 to $300 per ton of CO2. Now remember what I said at the beginning. One ton of CO2 is approximately one cubic meter of wood. So those of you who are forest managers, ask yourself, what could I do differently in forests if I had an extra 50 or a hundred, or hundred and fifty dollars per cubic meter to improve my forest management. So what we have learned from 
all of this is that we need to take an integrated systems approach to forest related mitigation actions. It would involve reducing emissions and incre increasing removals in the managed forest, storing harvested wood carbon for longer, using waste wood for energy, seeking to maximize displacement effects, and decreasing deforestation, in other words, the conversion of forests to other land uses, increasing, increasing the area of the forest. So in conclusion, the goal of the Paris Agreement to reach, to keep global temperature increases well below 2 degrees centigrade <coughs> cannot be reached without net negative emissions. That is, we remove more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than we're adding to it. The forest sector has both the opportunity and I suggest to you the responsibility to contribute to reductions in atmosphere greenhouse gas concentrations. Effective greenhouse gas mitigation strategies involve sustainable forest management and the use of long-lived products for carbon storage and substitution of emissions intensive materials, oops, including bioenergy. But it is important for us to understand that forests can make only a limited contribution towards net negative emissions. We can therefore only meet the Paris goals with rapid and immediate reductions in the use of fossil fuels. And if we fail to do this, it will only increase the risks for future positive climate feedback from forests and other ecosystem types around the world, which will require even greater future mitigation efforts if we want to keep the world to less than two degrees more. Thank you very much. Yes, so when trees decompose, the vast majority of the carbon is released to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So only a very small fraction of the carbon that is um, mineralized is actually accumulating in the soil. So the uh, soil carbon stock in the system with fires or with harvesting changed very little over time. Um, you, you, you can see only very, very small changes over time. If there are examples of very energy intensive short rotation forest activities where you say go from a 200 year cycle that is naturally occurring to a 30 year cycle of, of short rotation forestry and in those systems you might see a small decrease in soil carbon over time. But the, the, the beetle impact the trees will decompose and the carbon is released to the atmosphere. Thanks. Alguna otra question? 